Hannah, congratulations on the GRFP. Well oh, thank done. You. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> we have so many GRFP fellows. It's awesome. It looks like we're ready to go based on Brad's comments. Attending this panel, um, we have quite a bit of um, material uh, present for everyone. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our uh, panel panelists. Um, we have Jessica Webb, um, a professor here at the university. Um, we also have uh, Quinn McFrederick and oh, sorry, sorry. We have ben Sorry about the dogs. Um, Genesis, I think Laura said that her dogs are barking. Are barking. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. So today it's our diversity panel, and I will read a poem before our panelists introduce themselves. Genesis, I think Laura said that her dogs are barking. Are barking. Yeah. Okay. The poem. Hi, everyone. The poem is Thank you for being a lot here. of trying. So today is our diversity panel and I will be our poem before our panel. Hi, you can ask them your name. And I will be here. So today is our diversity panel and I will be here. Hi, everyone. A poem before our panel. Thank you for being here. So today is our Hey, Genesis, we're getting some feedback, I think, from your computer. Do you have the videos running in the background? Can you unmute yourself again? Genesis? Genesis, can you unmute yourself again so we can hear if there's extra feedback? Again. So do you have the video running on your computer in the background? So can you mute that from the Facebook feed so that we can't hear that? Now it's better? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. I didn't notice that I have an echo and I was making the things worse. So I think that I repeat things that Laura said. Um, does, does Laura read the poem already? Okay, so we can proceed with the poem. So, Crajans. We could learn a lot from Crajans. Some are sharp, some are pretty, some are dull, some have weird names and are all different colors, but they all have to live in the same box. So this will be the opening for our panelists to introduce themselves. We can start with Dr. Amy. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Merlo. I'm a new professor here at UCR in the Department of Entomology. I study insects that negatively impact animals and a lot of my work is uh, dealing with poultry and so chickens and insects that negatively impact uh, not only chicken behavior, but chicken welfare and health as well. Thank you, Dr. Amy. Now we can follow with Dr. Purcell. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Purcell. I'm also a not, not quite so new professor, <laughs> not so new anymore, in the Department of Entomology. And I study so, social behavior, so I really like to study 
um, how ants and bees and wasps um, interact socially and what, in particular, um, what are the genetic bases of that social interaction. So are there genes that control different social organizations? Thank you, Dr. Purcell. Now we can follow for our feature, Dr. Argeta. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am Magda Argeta. I am an international student uh, in the entomology department. I am pursuing a PhD, and I am on my third year in the Max Frederick Lab, and I am studying uh, bee communities and how bees may change from one side to another one, and how bees interact with microbes and uh, all interesting stuff. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Now we can follow up for our future, Dr. Hannah. Hi everyone, I'm not quite a doctor yet, but <laughs> trying to get there. Um, my name is Hannah and I study um, insect hormones and I like to tell people I study insect puberty because we're looking at how these hormones um, can change how these insects develop into adults. Um, and I use um, I do the, these studies using uh, fruit flies, so if you see little flies around your bananas, that's um, what I use. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Dr. McFrederick. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. I'm a professor in the Department of Entomology and in my lab we study the bugs that live within bugs. We study the microorganisms that live within bees especially. So just like us, bees get sick from microorganisms like bacteria and fungi and such, but just like us, they also have good bacteria that live with them as well. So we use those interactions to try to help save bees. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Dr. Perry. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Perry, and uh, I've been on the campus for a long time. Uh, I'm one of the senior faculty in the entomology department. Um, I study insects that attack our food and, and crop plants and agriculture. And uh, so I'm an applied entomologist, and uh, I work in an area called integrated pest management, and that is using uh, other insects, eat good bugs to eat bad bugs, helping farmers to plant their crops when they would be least affected by insects, and so that we can bring uh, healthy and good quality fruit and vegetables to our table. It's nice to be with you this afternoon. Thank you, and now our future Dr. Webb. Hey guys, uh, my name is Jessica Webb. I am a second year PhD student uh, here at UCR Cyber, which stands for Center for Integrative Bee Research. Uh, my current research is um, working towards creating a medication for one of those diseases that Quinn mentioned, uh, known as Nozema. Um, and I use different uh, defense mechanisms that they naturally have within their systems. Um, and I utilize that in hopes of making an oral medication for managed honeybees. Thank you, Jessica. And now we have to begin the panel. Um, first off, thank you all for being here. Sorry for the technical issues we had at the start. Um, I'm glad to see that those are resolved. Um, I'd like to go through and ask all of you, um, like, what was your dream career when you were young? Um, and how did that change to your actual career? Did you have fun things that we often do in, uh, like, the graduate circle and uh, popcorn between people? So that means I will pick someone, and once they answer, they can pick another of our panel guests to um, then answer the question. So, Amy, why don't we start with you? Um, can you tell me what your dream career was when you were young and how that might have changed your actual career? Okay, great. Uh, thank you. So uh, I, in fifth grade, was asked to do a project on the grossest thing I could think of. And fifth grade Amy, the grossest thing I could think of was cockroaches. And I remember very clearly sitting in the library reading this book about cockroaches, starting off at the beginning of my project going, ew, this is the gross thing. And then as I read about them, my attitude completely changed. And I was 
fascinated. And by the end of my project, when I got to present it to my class, I, I had looked it up and I was like, I want to be an entomologist. I think bugs are so cool and I just want to learn everything about them. And I think I'm probably one of the rare people who comes in um, knowing that or thinking that. Uh, so that kind of guided my, my career path in the sense that I was very science and math minded. Uh, when it was time for me to apply for college, I looked for the entomology program, which is somewhat rare um, in the U.S., but not impossible. So I actually went and got a degree in entomology. Uh, but just studying bugs, you know, learning everything about them isn't necessarily a career. So that's once I got into college, I was able to talk to other students and meet professors and actually figure out what, what a job would look like. And uh, what I learned about myself is that I like solving problems. And so I definitely wanted to go into like a problem solving type of application with entomology. And it took me a little while to figure out what system to work in. I worked in field crops for a while. I worked in turf grass for a while. And then um, finally settled on animals. Um, I do love animals and didn't even really know that I could merge the two. And uh, I don't want to take all the time, but that's pretty much how my career path um, went very briefly. So I've, I've definitely always had this fascination with weird, gross things, which has helped. And uh, I'll go ahead. And Hannah, you want to go next? Sure. Thanks, Amy. Um, so when I was growing up, um, I was actually really bad at science and failed like some of my science courses in high school. Um, but... I had this interest in law and forensic science, so like the science that's related to legal investigations. Um, so I took that class in high school and decided that I wanted to learn more about forensic science. Um, so in college, I looked for a degree or looked for a program to study that. Um, and as I was in that program, I started doing better in science because I was a little bit more motivated. Um, and people told me that you wouldn't succeed in science. So I was like very spiteful. So I tried really hard in my classes and um, got through the classes. Um, and then I discovered research because I was invited. I was really lucky and I was invited to join a research program in a lab that um, studied insects. Um, and this lab studied forensic entomology. So that's the use of insects um, in legal investigations. So after joining that lab, I discovered that I really, really liked working in the lab and similar to Amy, that problem solving aspect and that critical thinking aspect. So from there, I looked for more research opportunities and decided I wanted to further my education and pursue a degree in entomology. Um, so I still study insect development just um, in a different way, but I'm still really, I, that's like my main question and my main interest is how do insects develop and what controls their development. Um, so I'll popcorn to Jess. Okay. Um, so believe it or not, when I was younger, I would actually tell people that I wanted to be a bug doctor, but everybody thought that I was crazy because like, what's a bug doctor? Uh, so going into college, I actually ended up drifting way away from that dream and ended up uh, pursuing optometry. Uh, so. I went to a few optometrists, uh, shadowed them to see what kind of work they did, and it turned out that they have a really boring job. They just sit in front of these machines all day and say one or two, and I really did not enjoy that. Uh, so eventually I was able to find research um, on campus working in marine biology because, you know, who doesn't want to work with the sea turtles and the coral reefs? but there was a very big flaw in that dream because I can't actually swim. So I was working with um, these little, uh, I guess you could call them semi-aquatic insects. Um, they're like amphipods, they live in the sand, and they're kind of gross and weird. Um, so I said I should just work with the cool insects if I'm gonna work with insects anyway. And I found this internship uh, working with native pollinators, and I really enjoyed it. Um, it was a great time, but I noticed that a lot of people gave honeybees a bad rap as being disease spreaders. Um, so I then became a trader, uh, and I, when I came here 
to actually help the honeybees, um, to help them kind of get rid of some of those diseases. And so that's how I ended up in entomology. Uh, and with that, I will pass it to other Jessica. Thanks, Jess. Um, this is, yeah, this is a great question. So I actually, I feel like everyone had a much clearer idea of where they were going when they were young than I did. I. I remember being totally obsessed with several, multiple different careers at different points in my childhood. Um, one that stands out, I, I've always loved animals. I wanted to be a veterinarian for a little while. Um, but then the other the other competing interest is that I, I have always wanted to spend every waking moment that I could outside, outdoors. And I didn't really see, I mean, I know I, if you're a veterinarian, you can probably figure out ways to spend some time outside on farms um, if, you, if you do livestock veterinary science. But... Um, I was sort of always looking for ways to combine that love of the outdoors with love of animals. And so when I had the opportunity to um, carry, carry out research at university, um, I actually realized that that was a potentially viable career opportunity. So I, I did some research projects as an undergraduate. I did some research um, after graduating from my undergraduate, but before starting graduate school. And it was kind of a, a really happy um, surprise to, to realize that I could merge those two interests, that love of um, animals, including insect animals as well, and then that ability to go outside. And, and I know for, for some of us at least, I mean, being able to do some of my work outside is one of my very favorite parts of the job. I can travel a bit, I can see different parts of the world, and I can look at all of the amazing insects that live there. So that's that was my trajectory. And I'll... Uh, send it over to Magda. Thank you, Jessica. Um, ooh, I am a bit nervous, but happy to share. So I grew up in the south part of Mexico, and the weather is very humid, and all the vegetation is like a rain. It is a rainforest. So when I was a kid, I was very, very like fascinated by all the flowers and all the blooms and all the uh, a species that are like, well, at that moment, I, I didn't know what was an species, but by, by all the insects and animals that were visiting the flowers. And I think I fell in love with flowers and pollination since I, since I was a kid because all the interaction that I had with nature, but I only knew the rainforest. And then when I grew up, I moved to central Mexico to study uh, the college. And when I was in central Mexico, the, the vegetation it's different there because it's not rainforest anymore. So it's more like temperate. And then if you go a bit to the north to my country, you, you start having the deserts. So when I knew and I get to meet the arid environments, I again fell in love with them because I didn't know them. Right? I didn't know what was a cacti. I didn't know like all these different plant species and the beauty that they have when they bloom because if you have ever seen for example an opuntia blooming it's amazing it's super beautiful so i just fell in love with arid uh, vegetation plants and with their pollinators and then i decided to focus on the bee community because i discovered by reading and that that bees are super diverse in arid regions so for me it was like blowing my mind like knowing that Bees, you, you can find a lot of bee species and a lot of bee diversity, different shapes, different colors, different sizes of bees in the desert. For me, it was like opening my brain to a new universe of uh, research and discoveries. So I decided to continue studying bees in arid environments, and I moved to the U.S. Uh, at the end of the 2018 uh, to study uh the interactions that bees have in these um, vegetation ecosystems. And I didn't know anything about microbiology before. Like, I didn't think about the impact that the microbiota that we have living in our good, uh, in our stomach, I didn't think about the impact that the microbiota has for any, uh, or has in any species. And when I moved to, to conduct uh, or to study the PhD here, I met my professor, my, my, my advisor PhD, and he taught me about all these new worlds of microbes. And I got 
a lot of inspiration because it's completely like it was super intimidated for me at the beginning to actually believe that I was able to be a microbiologist as well. But when you have like the combination of microbiology and the ecology of bees and their interactions, it's super, super inspiring. And I decided to include that on my, on my um, PhD uh, studies. And yeah, I think I, w when I was a kid, I knew I liked the nature because I grew up uh, surrounded by, by nature. And I knew I wanted to study something related with flowers and something related with insects. But I didn't really um, discover, like with an official name, that that is um, that, that that was possible until I uh, studied the the, the college and, and decided to go for biology. But yeah, that's it. And I will popcorn to let me see. I will go back um, to Quinn actually. It's super fun to hear all of all of these stories to hear um, and super inspiring as well to me. If I were if I were a, a, in fifth grade, I'd totally want to become an entomologist after this, I think. Um, I like a crazy little kid. I had like all these wild ideas, you know, firemen, I want to own a ski shop, et cetera. Um, they kept changing over and over again, but eventually I also decided to, to get a, a degree in biology because I love nature. And I wound up actually working, um, when I was uh, undergraduate, I got an uh, internship at the San Francisco Zoo working in the insect zoo there. And we did a lot of stuff with bees. I grew up in the Central Valley of California where the almond pollination happens and we actually had a small almond orchard and so, bees as pollinators and the importance of bees was always in my mind. I wound up reading a, a book that sort of inspired me to want to study native bees. Um, eventually when I, when I started to do a master's, but after, but, but before I, I went to the master's, I spent about 10 years actually ha having what I thought was my dream job. So that was at the San Francisco Insect Zoo. After that, I worked in a zoo in Boston. I worked in an aquarium. I cleaned like the shark tank in an aquarium on, on Pier 39 in San Francisco. And then I worked at a little like children's museum in San Francisco. So all this sort of outdoor education um wildlife display sorts of things. Um, during that whole time, I loved all of that work, especially the shark tank was super fun, actually. I liked all of that work a lot, but I felt like I always wanted to be a scientist and I wasn't really a scientist. Like I knew a lot of natural history about different animals and such, but I really wanted to become a scientist because I, I felt like my entire, that whole 10 years that I was doing that, I felt like I sort of had scientist envy. Like I wanted to understand even more about what these organisms are. So the reason I'm telling that part of my story is that Many people know what they want to do from the get-go and they do really, really well as an undergraduate and they go right into graduate school. That wasn't my story at all. Um, I didn't do super great as an undergraduate. I didn't know that I wanted to be a scientist until later on in life. And I made it a little bit hard on myself, but you don't, I guess I'm telling you guys this because you might start off on one path but that path might not be the path that you wind up the rest of your life on. And that's okay too. So there's different ways that people come to, to their careers. And, um, and as long as you find a good career, that's, that's the most important part. And become an entomologist because it is a wonderful career. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Well, I'll go ahead and go um, since I think I'm the last one left here. Uh, Quinn, Quinn makes a good, uh, Dr. McFedrick um, makes a great point. And I think the most important thing that I would say to you who are listening on is stay in school, stay interested, keep pursuing. When I was a little boy, I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. And uh, if you've ever read any stories about Huckleberry Finn or, or Daniel Boone, any chance that I got, I was out on the riverbank fishing, 
with a cane pole and uh, or hunting rabbits and all kinds of fun things like that when I was a kid and and so that inspired me and I loved being outdoors like many of the other uh, panelists have talked about but uh, it was a great place to grow up um, and uh, when I went to school and I went to college I decided that I wanted to try and uh, figure out and study how I could how it could help the ecology of those animals that I was so fond of being out in nature with. And so I went to Oklahoma State University and I majored in wildlife ecology and research. And the research part of that was kind of the introduction to the to being a, to the science part because it taught me the tools that we use in research to do to do what we do. Well I went ahead and graduated and I happened to get lucky because when I was going to school, I uh, worked for the entomology department at Oklahoma State, and that introduced me to insects. Um, so by the time that I had finished uh, with that degree, uh, I didn't get a job working in wildlife ecology, and I started looking around and thinking, you know what? I've been working with these insects in agriculture, and there's a lot more jobs in agriculture because people have to eat. It's the underpinning of all society. So. I went ahead and went to graduate school in entomology in Texas and in Nebraska and then came out here to California where I'm still out, outside working with uh, these animals. Now, I started in ecology and I still study ecology. And the ecology that I study are usually with pest insects and the insects that feed upon them to learn about that ecology and how can we, how can we apply it to the benefit of, of agricultural producers and, and producing good quality foods. So that's my story. I'll just say once again, stay in school and stay interested and keep asking questions because there is a there is a career for you out there in whatever you want. Thank you so much. Um, all of you, I think this is a really good uh, introduction to the panel and sort of your background. Um, when we're reaching, kind of like heading towards our goals, we might come across a lot of difficulties. Are there any like major difficulties and like complications that you found yourselves dealing with? I feel like this can be um, familial, financial, like um, racial things, uh, difficulties due to life, just events. Um, if you could go through some of your... Oh, I'm sorry about the noise. If you can go through some of your difficulties that um, perhaps you dealt with and uh, might provide some insight into how other students and potential students um, might reach these goals, uh, that would be great. Um, Tom, since you went last, let's start with you on this one. There we go. Sure, thank you. Um, I mean, I think the difficulties that I faced and the challenges I faced with are, are some things with bullying when I was a kid and, um, uh, of course, studying and trying to stay focused on schoolwork and, and things. I, I do want to point out that I don't know if you can see this, this uh, painting behind me. That's my great-great-grandmother. She was a full-blooded Cherokee. And so... Um, I didn't have ever any, feel any uh, aggression towards uh, having Native American in my, in my blood. Um, I'm, and I'm super proud of, of that uh, happening. But I don't think, I certainly didn't uh, face the challenges that, that people of color chase, uh, face now. Um, and uh, I'm certainly aware of the privilege that I had of just being a white male growing up. So, um, all that said, I don't think I had nearly the challenges that students have have now, particularly students who are underserved or ethnically, uh, in, uh, economically challenged. Or um, that I grew up in a very large family. I have I have uh, eight sisters and one brother, so I was surrounded by women in my life, and so I've always been very comfortable working with and interacting. and And I truly believe that we have a a much richer and a much more full uh, environment when we are surrounded by people who have different life experiences than we have. So I'll uh, I'll popcorn that and I'll go back to Quinn since he didn't call on me last time. I'll call on him. 
<laughs> Tom, sorry for, sorry for, for getting you there. Um, well, so I was born with without fingers on my left hand, and I think that that's probably the thing that has. Um, I don't I don't like to think of myself as not being able to do stuff because of that, but I'm sure that it has made, and you know, because I was born that way, it's the only thing that I've ever known, so I can't say like I'd be able to do these things differently if I had fingers on this hand, because I don't have that experience, of course. Um, it does mean that when I was a kid, I would get teased about it and, and such, and that continues on through life in different ways like when you're out of elementary school then kids aren't teasing you anymore but people might people do treat you differently i think um not everybody but but some people do treat you differently like sometimes people i'll notice people want to help me when i'm trying to lift something more than they would help somebody else and i don't take offense at that because i know that they're coming from a good place that they're just trying to help me but i also realize that um, when people are slightly different than other people, they don't want to be treated differently, at least in my experience. Like, I, I, I realize that people that are trying to help me are coming from a good place, but I don't want them to want to help me, if that makes sense. Um, and there is, I did have one colleague who was really kind and helped me prepare, like, these examinations where I had to dissect a, a whole lot of insects and he, and he told me, oh, I'm sure with your hand it's very hard for you to dissect insects. And I accepted his help because I wanted his help getting the exam ready, but I also wanted to tell him, well, I did dissect 4,000 bees during my PhD, so I think I know what I'm doing a little bit, you know, I kind of have my head wrapped around it. So I, I think those were the biggest, those are sort of the biggest challenges. Um, that I've faced, I guess, but um, I also realize, like Tom mentioned, that I've been very, very lucky in many ways and very privileged in many ways as well. So while I can relate to being, having a different appearance than, than many people, there's also parts of, of other people's journeys that I can't directly, that I can empathize with, but I haven't experienced myself. Um, so that's, I think that's what but I'll share, and I will ping Dr. Murillo. Thanks, Quinn. Um, yeah, so thinking about my own journey, um, some of the difficulties I dealt with, uh, well, when I was graduating from college, we had a major economic recession. I graduated in 2009, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I didn't know anyway, but then there was a recession and that didn't help things. And I, my parents are not familiar with entomology. They're not entomologists. My parents didn't go to college. They couldn't really help me navigate graduate school if that was something I wanted to do because they just weren't familiar with it. So I had to rely a lot on my mentors, um, my undergraduate mentors. And I was fortunate to come from a department that had really good uh, professors who spent a lot of time and really valued undergraduate education and really valued undergraduate mentorship. And it wasn't always easy to, you, you kind of have to put yourself out there to get that kind of mentorship. It doesn't just fall in your lap if you don't seek it out. And so uh, that was definitely one of my difficulties and also um keeping an open mind about opportunities. Uh, what, I, what I wanted to do wasn't necessarily available or, um, you know, the opportunity that I did have, it was one of those situations where it's like, well, I can try this and see if I like it. And so I think trying to be open-minded about the opportunities that, that were available was, um, ended up being a good part of my journey to, to learn and, and grow from. Um, before landing with uh, the advisor I ended up with here at UCR and, and coming to California, which was definitely not my not my goal. I'm from New Jersey. I'm from a very urban area. I was not expecting to work on farm animals in California, but again, trying to be open-minded and and 
sometimes taking that leap of faith was, was something that was helpful for me. So with that, I'm going to go uh, next to me is Dr. Purcell. I'll let you go ahead next. Thanks, Amy. Um, I think I, I think I'll talk about one particular struggle. Um, I haven't, I faced some others. I mean, several people mentioned bullying and I certainly experienced bullying um, when I was young. And I think that that's tied in with this struggle that is still ongoing. Um, and I, not a few years ago now, there is a, I, I was able to, this is something it, you know, you, you continue on. And as you heard, um, you know, I'm a professor now. And, and it's still there. So the, it's a, sort of an interesting um, an interesting problem to deal with because on the one hand, you want to um, feel confident in what you're doing and present, your, present yourself as, as very confident. And then on the other hand, you kind of have to um, quash down those, those self-doubts. And so over the course of my career, um, I've had experiences where I've been in, um, in labs or in, in working groups with um, some negative voices and, and like learning how I personally need to overcome. Um, I mean, criticism is a part of science and so that's natural, but overcome that extra layer to, to sort of say, well, not only are my ideas okay, but you know, I can, I can push forward despite some of the issues that others identify or some of the criticisms of me as a researcher. Um, and so that's, that's something that it's been sort of just a constant conversation with myself about, you know, okay, you, you don't feel very confident, but, you know, try to put, try to put the confident face on and go out there and um, make the best of it. Or if you get if something that unexpected and, and negative happens. So for example, if I apply for a grant and I don't receive it, I've learned, or I've tried to learn to sort of take a beat and deal with the, the rejection that goes along with that and then say, well, dust myself off. Okay. Doesn't mean that the ideas are bad. That just didn't work out. And so just figuring out how I personally can overcome that self-doubt. And I think it's something that a lot of people feel, but it's still not talked about that often. So I was, I was so happy to learn of the term imposter syndrome where you just don't feel like you belong. You feel like you're, you're a bit of a fraud. Um, and that, that other people, at all levels feel that as well, um, actually helped me to sort of say, okay, this isn't just my issue. I, I can kind of face it, put a name on it, and try to figure out ways to work around it. Um, so that, that's something that, yeah, like I said, it's, it hasn't completely gone away, but I've learned strategies to um, face it and move on. So on that note, I'll popcorn over to Hannah. Thanks. Uh, so um, I guess some struggles I faced um, besides, you know, being bad at science and math when I was growing up, um, like people will judge you based on, you know, how you look, um, based on like the question posed, like based on your race, your gender, um, sexual orientation, etc. Um, and like, you know, I'm not going to go into all the stories, but you know, those are all of those factors, you know, um, will affect how you pursue your career and like opportunities, whether you feel like like the imposter syndrome might set in and you feel like you're not um, qualified for certain things. And I think whenever situations like that arise, um, my philosophy is to use it as motivation. And then in the end, to lead by example, once you're in a position that you might have a little bit more power. Um, and like, it's really hard to like not get down when you encounter people or situations that try to, you know, just judge you based on something they don't really know. Um, but yeah, I think... For me, it's just using those experiences as motivation to kind of push on and keep trying to succeed. Um, and I'll popcorn to Magda. Thank you, Hannah. So for me, um, I think the one that I want to share uh, with you that I consider the most important or one of the most important is uh, the social expectations on women. I told you I come from uh, a small town in Mexico, and in that culture, and I love my country and I love my roots and everything, but in that culture, um, the expectation for women is uh, to finish high school and then most likely to marry, have a husband, have a family, uh, procreate, and similar. And I... I really, really, 
uh, like to have the opportunity of choosing if that is the path that you want to follow. Uh, there is nothing bad with that. But also, if you want to follow another path, like pursuing a career or being a professional woman, being a scientist, I would like young girls to have the opportunity to actually decide what they want to be. If they want to uh, become a professional, like a lawyer, an entomologist, an ecologist, a biologist, like whatever career dream they, they have, I would like them to have the opportunity to actually recognize that there is no path already decided for young girls. Young girls need to have the opportunity to decide what they want for them. So one part of my family is very conservative. Uh, one part of my family doesn't approve that I am not married at my age, that I am living alone in another country, um, just by myself with no man, uh, in my side, um, and that I am still studying. Like they, my, my grandparents from from the line of my father, they don't really understand it. Like why 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 are you want why do you want to become a scientist? What is that? Like you should be doing another stuff. So I think dealing with that um, expectation that society and your family. Uh, sometimes your friends, like dealing with those expectations that society may have on your shoulders is hard because you want to be part of your family. You want to be accepted by your family. You want to be in good terms with your family as well. And then you face a lot of this debate, like, am I doing the right stuff? Am I doing the right pursuing this scientific career? Like, Am I doing the things wrong? But I, oh, whenever those debates come to my mind, I always like to think about uh, the independence and the, the independence that I can bring uh, to my life and to my uh, and to, to the persons that are like surrounding me. Um, so I think. I think it's important to talk about uh, these um, social expectations that women may have. And it's important whenever you are facing that to talk with any ally that you may find, like any friend, any mentor, like uh, a professor or maybe a member of your family that is on your side that can understand you, just to talk about how, how are you feeling and telling that person that I, I really want to do this, but society is telling me to do the other, or my family is telling me to do the other, like I am struggling with this, just reach out for help, ask for help, and uh, be aware that there is there, there are people around you that uh, can be your ally on this journey and that you are not alone. So in some moments it feels hard to find people that actually can understand you, but you, I have found Fortunately, I have found people that is like on my uh, net of support, and that's. I think that's it. And I will pop corn uh, to Jessica Webb. Uh, thank you, Magda. Um, I think for me, the biggest struggle uh, was just kind of growing up in the environment that I grew up in. Um, so I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. It's a very urban area. Um, very uh, poor economically. Uh, so I didn't know a lot of, I didn't know any scientists. Everybody that I knew was a blue collar worker. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college. Um, even in elementary, middle, high school, um, there was not a lot of funding to fund these types of, you know, um, science programs that, you know, many other uh, people may have gotten the opportunity to opportunity to experience. Um, and so even then, when I went off to college, I ended up going to an HBCU. Uh, so if you don't know, that stands for Historically Black Colleges and Universities. Uh, so they're majority black um, colleges. And so they are oftentimes also underfunded. Um, so 
they won't have the same opportunities that your your bigger universities will will have. Um, so oftentimes I'll feel like I didn't get the same experiences or opportunities that um, some of my counterparts will have, and it sometimes leads to like a sense of isolation just because I don't have you know the same experience that everybody else does. But I think that just kind of plays into um, the imposter syndrome that uh, Jessica Purcell was talking about. Um, so that's just one of those things that you know you kind of have to realize that everybody everybody feels like they don't have as much experience as they would like. Um, it's it's a it's a mental thing that you just kind of have to to figure your own way um, around. And so that's that's my answer. Thank you all for sharing these experiences. For sure, we all have different paths, and we never know how, when we will end. So, never stop dreaming and follow your dreams. So now we have like our last question: um, What are the motivation, the inspiration that you have, and any advice that you can give to people that would like to pursue a scientific career? Yeah, sorry. So we can start with Jessica Webb and then Popcorn. You kind of repeat the question. I think you cut out on the first part. Oh, sorry. Like, what are the motivations and inspirations that you have in your career? And any advice that you can give to people that would like to pursue a scientific career? Okay. Uh, so for me, my motivation is actually my younger niece. She's like eight years old, um, and she she inspires me to keep going on a daily basis. Whenever I talk to her, she's always asking me questions about bees and all the different things. Uh, and so that's that's one of the reasons that I that I keep going, just to know that she will have someone to look up to that is in, that is a scientist or that you know can help get her through college and all of, all of those types of um, uh, opportunities and roadblocks uh, that she might face um, leads me to, you know, continue doing what I'm doing just so that she has that type of, um, that type of role model in her life. Um, and for anybody who wants to pursue a career in entomology, my advice is to just do it. Even if you don't think you can, you don't know where to start, tell people what you want to do. Uh, somebody somewhere will know how to get you started. Um, and that's, that's all that I have. Uh, I'll pass it to Tom. Okay, so uh, if you're watching this uh, live stream, you might be surprised what I'm going to say, but you are, sorry, you already are a scientist. I have a very broad definition of what a scientist is, and I believe we were all born scientists. And my definition is a scientist is someone who's curious about the world around them. Are you curious about the world around you? Whatever it is, are you curious about the world around you? If so, then you were born a scientist, and you are a scientist. Let me get back to this. I don't know where I cut out, but I guess uh, I tell you I, I think everybody's a scientist. Do y'all get that part? Okay. So scientists don't just wear lab coats and wear pocket protectors. We do have some tools that we've learned how to use, and that's how we do what's interesting to us. But you also might think that, oh, I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm a musician or I'm a writer. I'm going to put my go off a of video here. I want you to see my picture here, and I'm playing a guitar. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a musician too. So scientists aren't just these people that live in labs and do these things. So what I would say to you is stay curious. Don't let the classes where you have to memorize all the lists of all the scientific terms, don't let that turn you away from thinking that you can do science. Because we all, all of us on this panel, we had those kinds of classes. You need to look past those memorization lists to the places where you're still curious about the world around you. 
And by the way, insects, there are more insects than any other kind of organisms in the world. About half of all the insects, of all the animals in the world are insects. That's why it's such a wide field. That's why you can have people study entomology to do agriculture and do urban pests and do biology of bumblebees and do parasites of bees and all these things because insects have such a big impact on, on our society. So my advice to you, continue being a scientist because you already are. It's already inside you. So I'm going to move next to Hannah. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I think the biggest thing that motivates me is um, being able to work with other people, students, and then you know my lab mates, and being able to just think about questions, any question really, um, and then being able to talk to them about those questions and then come up with either some way to solve it or determine that, like, the answer to that question experimentally. Um, and just, like, like to me, being a scientist, like, in a lab right now is being able to think of something, anything you want to do, and then come to work and be able to test that question that you think of. Um, of course, there are limitations, but, you know. Um, and I guess advice I can give... Um, I think just like Tom said, to keep asking questions and keep, you know, don't be afraid to talk to people. Um, and I echo what Jess said as well about telling people what you want to do because, yeah, someone will be able to help you. Um, someone will hear you somewhere and they'll be able to help you and put you in contact with the right people to get you to whichever, you know, job or career that you want. Um, I'll popcorn to... Uh, Jessica Purcell. Thanks, Hannah. I think I'll build on your answer because I completely agree with you. So um, what motivates me is are the parts of my job that I love, and I'll share a couple of those with you. One is exactly what Hannah just said, that process of discovery. So um, as a scientist, I get to try to answer questions that nobody else has ever answered before and try to learn things that nobody knows yet and share them with the community. And like that is to me such an exciting thing, such an exciting privilege that that's part of my job. And my curiosity has always been very broad. And so um, I always have more questions to ask than I can possibly answer, but that makes it fun. Um, and then the other thing that I really love to do, and, and fortunately, my job combines both. I, I've always loved teaching people. Um, so actually getting to um, teach students both in the classroom and just one-on-one -on -one as, a, as a mentor, um, it's just it's so much fun to watch that process of, of discovery, of understanding, um, and to try to make it as interesting and engaging as possible. So those that part of the job keeps me going. There's parts like paperwork that... I could do without um, very happily. And I guess my advice is, and, and this is something that I, I wasn't very good at myself, but if you, um, it's worth trying different things and you can, you can start sooner than you think. So if you, if something that you hear today is like, wow, that sounds amazing. You can, uh, at any stage of your um, education, you can reach out to people and say, hey, what you talked about, you know, your career choice or what you're studying, it sounded really interesting. Can you tell me more? And sometimes opportunities arise from things like that. It's, I mean, I can trace my own career trajectory to a series of unlikely um, opportunities that I just happened to fall into and that really shaped who I am today. And so you can take a little bit more command of that and write to people who you're, you're curious about what their job entails, or you'd like to shadow them for a day, or you would like to visit their workplace, obviously not right now because so many workplaces are closed, but, um, and just get in the habit of, of asking, and through doing that, you'll meet people who can then help um, to steer you towards opportunities that you may not have otherwise been aware of. So on that note, I'll pop corn to Quinn. I totally agree with the with working with wonderful colleagues like the people that are that are on this panel, um, working with with students like Magda, amazing student, and to see her science take off. All of those things are super exciting. Being able to discover, like most recently, I was just digging up bee nests and figuring out the architecture of a bee nest. Like to be the first person to do that, it's a silly little thing, but it's so much fun. Um, so I totally agree with, with all of that. Um, 
and I love that what Jessica was talking about the informational interview, like talking to people about how how they got where they were and and pursuing that. And the one thing that I would like to add is that um, sort of building off of the imposter syndrome thing that we were talking about earlier, like don't ever let other people, especially, tell you that you can't do something. If somebody tells you that oh, you can't do math because X, Y, and Z people are not good at math and you're one of those people. That's not true. That's a lie. You can do good at math if you want to do good at math. If you want to be a scientist, you can be a scientist. If I can make it as a scientist, you can make it as a scientist too. I don't consider myself to be the smartest person in, in any room. I just am really passionate about that discovery part of, of my job and I love that and so I'm willing to work to get that freedom to be able to ask those kinds of questions. I will ping over to Mike. Thank you. Um, so my motivation, well I think I have two big motivations. The first one is that as a person that is studying bees, and field uh, community, field uh, um, bees that live in nature, like nature, natural communities, I really like to have the opportunity to go outside and to search for them. Like for me, that is amazing. Like that is part of my job, like going outside to beautiful places, searching, looking for flowers and searching for bees. For me, that is amazing because I really like to be like connected with the environment and I think that is amazing. And the other motivation I have is to transfer knowledge. Like I love the idea of being a professor and being a teacher so I can share my experience and not only my experience but the knowledge uh, with other people, with the students, with um, people that want to learn as well. and share these uh, scientific discoveries and build together, continue building together science and knowledge. So I love that. And one advice I would have is uh, to make your passion, whatever you want to study, to make your passion your refugee. Like there are a lot of struggles uh, that are in the world and there are a lot of struggles that you may be facing. But if you make your passion your refugee and the safe place you can be, that will keep keep you safe as well. And with that, I would like to be uh, Amy. I'll keep it brief. Uh, so definitely my, my curiosity to echo everyone else, my curiosity drives me, my drive to solve problems is something that keeps me going. Um, especially this last year when we don't get to interface with people, which is something that I really enjoy doing. I, I love having conversations with people and talking science and, and talking through problems. Um, so ultimately, that's what it boils down to. And my advice for everyone, besides being curious, um, would also be to take time to reflect on what you enjoy doing and what it is at its core that um, interests you and motivates you, you know, we're talking about big field level types of things, you know, entomology might interest you, but what interests you with, within that? And, you know, like I said, problem solving is, is that what interests you? Is that what motivates you? Um, I think that self-reflection and figuring out what you like to do, how you like to learn, what you like to learn, all these things can help, um, help you learn more about yourself and, and drive you throughout your your life. Well, thank you all for sharing these exciting and wonderful advices and what makes what motivates you. It's really exciting. Thank you all for being here and please everyone just follow your curiosity and keep continue pursuing your passion. Thank you all for being here. Bye. Bye, everybody.